So uh, sitting with me now, Netroots uh, Nation 2018, uh, she is running for uh, Congress in New Mexico's first district, mm -hmm. Deb Holland. She would be, my understanding is you would be the first Native American woman elected to the yes. House of Representatives? Yes. And, all right, so that's... 240 years. <laughs> I mean, we're, uh, we're almost ready. <laughs> hey, exactly. It's only taken, you know, a quarter of a century, but that's okay. Um, so, okay, so... Um, but let's let's back up a little mm -hmm. bit. Um, give me a sense of, of of what you've been doing in politics uh, through your life and, and, and oh, how sure, we get to this point. Oh, sure, sure, sure. Well, you know, I probably got in, involved mm, close, verging on 20 years ago, just started out as a phone volunteer because I felt like I wanted, you know, I wanted candidates who cared about Indian issues to get elected. And so... I would go into campaign offices, ask for lists of Native Americans, and uh, make phone calls. Uh, I just felt that uh, in New Mexico, we're about 10% of the population, actually over right now, over 10%. And I just felt that we could have an effect on on getting folks who cared about our issues elected. So uh, that turned into me showing up, actually organizing in Indian country, and so I got, I got paid for a few elections as a staffer. And in 2012, I was the state Native American vote director for President Obama's re-election campaign. And um, so I've been at it for a while. Was there something about this time that convinced you to run? Or is this something that you've... you've you well, I had never thought of running for Congress. No, absolutely not. I, in fact, I, I didn't even think about running for office at all when I first got started. Uh, I just did it because I felt I wanted more Indians to vote. But in 2014, I decided to run for lieutenant governor. We were experiencing um, just kind of some low morale in New Mexico for the Democrats. We had a Republican governor. In fact, she's still there. She's termed out this year. Uh, she was terrible, doing t terrible things to our state and had a ton of money. And everyone just were bracing themselves for her re-election in 2014. And, and I thought, you know, I'm just going to run because I felt like I might be able to energize some folks. And um, we lost in the general. And then I decided to, uh, and we lost our state house that year also. And so that's what, that's what um, influenced me to run for state party chair. And I won that election in 2015. And then we won everything back in 2016. We, we, we had a great year for Democrats in New Mexico in 2016. And so this year uh, we'll get a Democratic governor. Uh, we'll, keep, uh, my, we'll keep this seat a blue seat because it is now and hopefully flip the southern district in New Mexico to blue as well. So, all right, uh, give me a sense of what the top issues are. I mean, a lot of we hear is, um, if, if, if I'm to believe uh, what we hear coming out of Washington, what not, all you're talking about is Donald Trump. Uh, is that the no. case? No, <laughs> no. I try. In fact, I try to talk about him as little as possible. I understand. <laughs> I mean, Believe people me. know. You know, they want to know that you're you're going to put up a fight. And right. yes, so I I will do that. But uh, there are a lot of pressing issues. One of those is climate change and renewable energy, and that's that was the actually the number one issue in my primary election campaign. We talked a tremendous about, amount about that. Uh, currently in New Mexico, in my district, there are a tremendous number of people who uh, care about immigration because the latest immigration policies coming out of Washington, D.C. and out of the White House are appalling. Uh, they're racist. It's terrible. Uh, we care about that in New Mexico. And uh, so that's another big issue. And, of course, uh, with this Supreme Court nominee, uh, you know, hanging over everyone's head, uh, there is a tremendous amount of concern about women's reproductive rights. Uh, I am, you know, I've been on the front lines fighting for that as well for a long, long time. But you know, everything, education, veterans. I mean, it, it's it, it's all it's all important, and we're we're talking about all of those things. I'm hearing too that uh, a lot of candidates are saying uh, health care is a big issue. Indeed, yes. And w where are you on that? 
Medicare for all. I mean, everybody needs health care. Everybody needs to be able to go to the doctor when they're sick. Uh, everybody should be able to get birth control pills prescribed, you know, by any uh, insurance company. Uh, I am definitely, I would never ever vote to repeal the Affordable Care Act until there is there is absolutely something uh, to replace it, like Medicare for All. What, what um, does Medicare for All mean to you? I mean, the, well, it means, it certainly means that every single person will have the opportunity for health care. And uh, in my state, uh, just to give you an example of the size and sort of poverty issues that we face in New Mexico, Half of our population is Medicaid eligible. So wow. uh, there aren't enough jobs. They're not paying enough. Uh, people need some relief. And so wait, when we say Medicare for all, everybody has health insurance. Um, does that mean we have basically the same parameters of Medicare as it exists today for people over the age of 65 and we expand that? Or what? what are there specific bills that you'll support that you know are out there? Right. I mean, I, I of course, I'm not in Congress yet, but um, there, and you might know, you probably know that Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal just started a Medicare for All caucus. So uh, I would like to join that caucus. I would like to work on a plan to uh, to make sure that whatever we do is, is a viable, um, is viable for people across the country and um, one of the themes that has been cropping up is the relationship between local politicians people running in the district and the DCCC mm -hmm. the DNC there's mm -hmm. been a lot of stories about this that, that cut across both ideological lines but um, what what has been your experience I mean you were already sort of part of the Democratic I don't want to say establishment but part of the the democratic mm -hmm. machine mm -hmm. in uh, in your state so was well, this as much uh, of an issue for well, you? Well as state party chair of course mm -hmm. you have to work with the DNC right. and uh, the DNC actually uh, gives states money every month to help with the party so we the money that the DNC gave us for example we were able to hire a vo vi voter file manager and pay for some other things so uh, I mean this wasn't as much of an issue for you as it might have been for other uh, uh, candidates. I mean, I, I think they I think they give money to every state. So uh, and so, look, uh, I'm a team player. I want us to win back the st the house in November. Me too. Uh, I will uh, work with the DNC. I'll work with the D Triple C. I'll work with the folks on the ground. I'll work with the county parties. Whatever we have to do to make sure that we win back the house, that's what I will do. Um, the, the, something I'm ex especially uh, happy about this year is that the DNC actually uh, gave out um, uh, money to various, I'm not sure if it's every state, but they gave it to our state to help us get out the Native American vote. As it's 10.5% 10 per 10 of our population in New Mexico. They're rural communities all over New Mexico. Uh, they gave the state party money for that purpose. Uh, I'm extremely happy about that. That's what I've been working on for a long time. That's where my passion lies. So I think that uh, I think the DNC is is working hard to engage people right. uh, uh, across the spectrum. So uh, I'm happy about that. I think rural communities really need our attention, and uh, so that's that's a good thing. Give give me a sense of of the sort of the unique issues of uh, of Indian folk in this country because they're you know we. We there's there's it seems to me that there is a um, an awakening of sorts that's that's taking place maybe in the context of, of Trump, but I think before that with Black Lives Matter um, and this uh, you know uh, the notion of intersectionality has become um, you know I think widely adopted and uh, at least in some form or another um, on the uh, the left I think there's a broader understanding that. Um, a different understanding of what is so-called identity politics and the, the importance of, mm -hmm. of, of specific concerns of specific groups being addressed and then almost like uh, communitarianized, I guess, if you will. Uh, but, but, but give me the, the perspective that you have on, uh, on politics in terms of, of, uh, of Indian uh, people because we don't, Native Americans seem to be sidelined in, in many respects of these conversations. Right, yeah, they haven't been invited to the a seat at the table in many respects. 
And um, so having a seat at the table, having a voice in the halls of Congress, I think um, it definitely will be new. Right. And um, but I, I hope to I mean, I will absolutely bring my background, my history, my perspective to the table. Um, I think that, um, you know, I went to Standing Rock in 2016. I took uh, some New Mexico green chili with me. I cooked on the campfire at, Ch at Chairman Archambault's camp, uh, shared our New Mexico food with the people there. Um, I, I, I feel like that uh, sustained protest uh, f to protect our environment was something that helped a lot of people sort of understand what it is that we truly care about. And uh, certainly if we don't have our environment, we don't have anything. It's very plain to see. So um, I, I really hope that um, perhaps uh, what I can do is, is help other people to realize how important the Native American voice is uh, in our politics and moving forward. Uh, because look, we have, we have a torturous history in this country. And um, when you think about the, the Trump administration separating families at the border, uh, that happened to us during the boarding school right. era, right? My grandmother was separated from her family for five years when she was starting when she was eight years old. Uh, those are, uh, you know, those, that history, uh, it's, it's eerily um, similar to what's happening now. And uh, so we know, we know about, we know about genocide, we know about family separation, we know about our land being taken, uh, we know about these things. So our voice uh, can be extremely important to the progressive movement, and I think that um, I, I would like to, to see us have more of, of an opportunity to speak, to speak at the table. Do you think that there's something, I mean, the idea that um, in the American psyche, the ability to ignore that history that recent history even of of what we've done to to native uh, people in this country is a is like some type of i mean i, I don't want to over psychological you know make it uh, too psychological but there's it's almost as if we, we cannot deal with that original sin uh of the founding of this country and so anything subsequent has to also be completely expunged from our national consciousness. Yeah, that's, you know, and I want to keep that memory alive. We ha we can't ever forget those things. We and and the sad fact of it is that there are a lot of people in this country who don't even know about our history of this country. And the, the only way I think you can truly understand um sort of where we are now is by by learning about the history of our country there have been so many um so many things that have happened you know i i just finished reading this book called uh, killers of the flower moon it's about the osage murders and osage uh tribe in oklahoma when they struck oil on their land after they had been pushed onto this reservation land uh, when they struck oil on their land uh, people started dying because they were being killed so that folks could come in and take over their head rights for, uh, and it was all about money, right? right. So, I mean, there, there, there's been fights over oil. There's been fight, you know, it's, it's, it's so uh, ingrained in our history. And if you don't, I think the way to um, move forward is definitely to make sure that we understand and know uh, the the fights that we've had in the past, so that we can arm ourselves and and make it better. Uh, Deb Holland, uh, hopefully we'll see you in uh, Congress uh, by this time next year. Absolutely. Uh, good luck. Thanks and, so much. Uh, where can folks go to, to learn more about your candidacy? Thank you. Deb for Congress.com. D-E-B-F-O-R Congress.com. You can find us on Twitter at D-E-B, the number four Congress. And of course, we're on Facebook, Deb Holland for Congress. All right. We will post that in today's uh, show notes and it'll be on the blog at Thanks majority.fm. So Thank you, Deb. I really appreciate it.